And then I reply, so you're going to drop me off? And she replies, yes, if you can. I'll take it to you as soon as I'm done. And then my response to her is, okay, what time do you need me to be ready? Her response is, what time do you need me to be ready? I think we missed someone the, right there. Okay. I, I tell her at 7.30, and she responds, okay, I'll be ready by then. Okay, so does, does that in fact uh, come to be? Yes. How does that happen that morning of the night? I, I leave my house in the morning with my oldest son in the car. I drive over to my mother's house. I pick her up and Dominic. She puts her car seat in the back for Dominic. Um, she straps him in and we leave the house to drop off my oldest son at Finley. At the time was the school he was attending. And then we leave to my work so she can drop me off. Uh, what, what kind of vehicle would she normally drive? She would drive my car. But when she wasn't driving your car? Oh, she would drive my mother's truck. Do you remember what kind of truck that is? It was a Blue Expedition, Blue Explorer. Well, it's an Explorer, like an mm -hmm. SUV? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Okay, but she, what's the reason about your car? She liked your car? Well, no, my mom was having issues with her truck. It would have issues starting up. So your car was more reliable? That's correct. Um, and what, is your, what, what kind of car did you have? And not only that, my mom used her car also for work, and she didn't know at times what time she needed to step out to the bank or anything if she needed to leave. So my car, I, I, I go to work, I leave my car there, and I use the company car to do my visits for my patients. So my car would literally just be sitting there. Okay. So uh, you all would help? Griselda out with uh, lending her the car, whether it be your mom or yourself. That's correct. Okay. Let me approach you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what the mark uh, states. Is it 107, 108, 109, and 113? These, I recognize him, that's my car. Okay, I believe these have previously been admitted. I think they've been admitted. Yes. Mm -hmm. These previously have been admitted. Mr. Public. Mr. Court. Okay, so this is the car that she would have been driving on the 9th? That's correct. Okay. Do you know where this location is? Yes. Where? It's at the uh, Father McNoble Park. The Father Magdebel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you been there before? Uh, yes, we grew up in that park. We've been going there since we were school age. How far do you, do you, do you all, did you all live from that park? A couple of blocks from my house, just down the street. And what part of, what part of town is this in, uh, please tell the jury? It's off of Mines Road. The first subdivision, it used to be called back in the day, Delwood. It was the first subdivision. You head on Bristol all the way down and you hit the park. Okay. It's, and it's actually a big complex, correct? Yes, it, it's grown very much since we moved there when I was about 11. So it, it's grown to soccer field, baseball field, a trail to bike and run in. Okay. <coughs> all right. You recognize this photo? Yes. What do we see in here? Dominic's car seat in the back of my car. The, did you already have that in there or was it placed by? Yourself? No, she placed it the morning that she used the vehicle. Okay. So how did you facilitate that morning uh, giving her your car? Like how did you, how did you do it? You said uh, you were gonna go by early in the morning? I went to pick her up after leaving my home with my son, I picked her up, she put her car seat in the car, she 
got in the car, she strapped in Dominic. We left to drop off my son at his elementary school and we left to my work. We get to my work, I get off, I ask her if she could bring me breakfast, so she went to Chick-fil-A, which was the nearest, closest restaurant to get me breakfast. Um, she comes back, brings me my food, and I... I get my food from her. I look to the back seat and my nephew's sitting in his car seat. What's he doing? He's eating some chicken minis from from Chick-fil-A. And he turns around and looks at me. And I just blow him a kiss from afar. And I tell him goodbye that I'll see him soon and that I love him. And I tell my sister goodbye. And that's the last time I saw them both. Do you know where your sister was going? <clears throat> where was she going, if you know? She was... Um, heading home to change because they were going to head to the uh, Father McNobie Park uh, to meet Dominic's father. Do you know how many phones your sister had? Yes, yeah, she, <clears throat> she had two phones. She had one working phone and she had another phone that Dominic, she would carry for Dominic and he would see, you know, the little educational videos and songs that he would listen to on the phone from daycare. What was the, the, name, the first name of the father of Dominic as far as you knew? Anthony. Did you know the last name? Anthony Burgos. Is that, are those the only two names you knew? At the time, that's the only names I knew. Okay. Now let's go a little bit further after that morning. If you, the last time you saw her was after more or less 8.30 in the morning when she dropped you off your food. Um, did you ever try to make contact with her later that morning? I did, but she no longer answered her phone. When did you attempt making contact with her, or why? It, it had already been a little, you know, a little too long. She was going to come pick me up before lunch, and it was not usual for her. Do not call or text or send a photo of Dominic if they were out somewhere. Okay. And what if anything happened close to close to the lunch hour? <clears throat> Several things happened simultaneously. So I have my phone and I get um alerts from Vivint if there's ever anybody detected in your camera or if anybody rings your doorbell. At the same time that I'm receiving these messages, my, my phone rings and it's a call from an investigator or a detective and... you remember his name? Um, Rodriguez or Ramirez? Uh, or what, or? There was two officers. I think um, one of them was in a suit 
and one of them was more casual with jeans and a, like a polo shirt. Okay. And he was wearing a homicide lanyard. Would that be Gilbert Benavides? That, that's correct. How, how did you know he was wearing a homicide lanyard? Did you see him in person, or did you see him on your visit, or how, how did you? <clears throat> I saw him in person when I got home. Oh, so you um, went home? He called me over the phone, and they told me if I was the owner of a, Mer he described my Mercedes, and I told him that yes. He told me that he had found my car abandoned at the Father McNoble Park. And I told him that it wasn't abandoned. I told him that my sister was with my nephew in the car, that my sister was there. And he asked me who my sister was, and I told him her name, and he told me he needed to speak to me. And I told him that what was wrong, if he could tell me. And he didn't say any more. He said that I needed to come in person, or he can come to me. And I told him I could go home, that it was not a problem. How did you get home? I. When I'm on the phone with him, my line is ringing. My husband's already calling me. And I hang up the phone with him. I switch over the line. And I tell my husband to come pick me up. And he tells me, I'm already on my way. Everything was happening so quickly because he also gets the alerts from Vivint. So while I'm talking on the phone, I imagine he was able to see the video closer and see what who was at the house by looking at their uniforms. So he tells me he's on his way to pick me up. He picks me up at work. Uh, and he takes me to the house. <clears throat> what happens when you get home? We get there within about five minutes. And I, he pulls up to the driveway. And I automatically jump out of the truck and run toward where the officer is at. And I tell him where my sister's at. And they tell me to calm down and to relax. And that why am I asking about my sister? And I tell them that if they have my car, my sister is there. <laughs> because my sister <laughs> and my nephew were with my car. So I need them to look for my sister. <laughs> I need them to look for my nephew. identify your sister for the police? I'm sorry? Were you able to identify your sister, give them her name and description? Yes, he asked me for my sister's name. I give him my sister's name. I give him Dominic's name. And he tells me, why would your sister have your car? And I tell them that she was meeting Dominic's father at the park and that she should be there. And, and then the, he goes on to ask me, who was she meeting? And I tell them, Anthony. And I'm telling him, he's a border patrol. And his face, when I say that, his face just changes. And he tells me, what? And I tell him, yes, she was meeting the baby's father, Anthony. He's a border patrol, and he goes on to ask me, Anthony, what? And I said, Anthony Burgos. And at this time, the other officer is coming in front of me, and he's stepping off to the side, and I can see him grabbing his radio or something and starts talking on it, and I just turn around to try to, to see what he's doing, and the other officer starts asking me questions, trying to distract me so I won't listen to what he's doing. And he, tells, he starts asking me about my sister, why my sister had my car, the same thing he had asked me. So I already start panicking and getting very angsty. How do you come to find out what happened to your sister? He comes back and asks me to have a photo of her or something that I can show him. And I show him the photos, and he still doesn't tell me anything. He, they, all they keep telling me is that they're looking, that they keep looking, and that they're looking for her, but that they don't find them anywhere near the car. By this time, more family's gone to my house. My mom's already there. 
my dad's there, my godparents are there, my husband is there, but they still, they're not telling anybody anything. Um, I steal my husband's keys and I go in his truck to the park <laughs> to go and try to find my sister. <laughs> And I go and I see my car where it's parked. I look all around, but there's nothing. There's nothing, just my car and the detective next to it. And I'm trying to look through the bushes, through the trees, see if I see anything, nothing, nothing near, nothing near my car. They told me I have to go home. I head back to my house and it isn't until hours later till I'm told that my the sister and my nephew were murdered. <laughs> were you able to go to the police station and talk to the police? Yes. And while, while you were there, did you provide them information? at the station that afternoon? Yes. Now, I'm gonna switch gears here and bring your attention back to the, the leg injury now. Now that Dominic has been killed, what, if any, concerns did you have about that leg injury? They were no more concerns. I knew it was him that he tried to kill him the first time he saw him. What, if anything, did you do? What type of action did you take, if any? I told the officers that <clears throat> prior to Dominic's murder, he had been hurt. And we all suspected it was an insect bite, but that they needed to look into it because I was highly suspicious, if not certain, that it was his father that had tried to kill him at the park the first time on their meeting. Did you do anything else? Did you call anyone? I called the coroner myself because I was afraid that it was going to fall through the cracks and nobody was ever going to tell her to look into Dominic's leg. And it was going to go unseen as if maybe he sustained that injury the day that he was murdered. And I was right when I phone called her. She had no idea. Nobody had told her yet. Okay. And when you say her, who is her? Who is she? Dr. Stern, the coroner. That's Dr. Corrine Stern? That's correct. And she's a Webb County Medical Examiner? That's correct. And you asked her to do what? If she could please examine his left leg because he had sustained an injury prior to his murder and that I was highly suspicious and certain that it might have been an attempt on his life. Do you remember taking her some photos so that she could see the, those uh, images? Yes. We've seen some of those photos already, and, and were you able to, sh to show Dr. Stern those photos so she could look at the leg? Yes, but it was at a, at a later time when she had already done all her examination. Okay, and, um, but do you know if she did in fact re-examine the leg? She did. She told me herself that she would be excising a good amount for future testing to find out exactly what was going on with his leg. Okay. Um, now keeping in mind, this is in reference to the injury that he would have received 15 days before, correct? That's correct. So this is already more than two weeks prior. You're asking her to look at the injury to his leg, correct? That's correct. At this point in time, was there still nothing on the surface visible as far as necrosis? Nothing but a pinpoint and about 2.5 cm of bruising all around. 
what appear to be bruising. It's a message from my sister. That message between you and your sister? That's correct. Okay. Any objection? And and it's it's a uh, approach. What number was that again? Four, uh, this is going to be 498. 498. 498. States 498 is, is admitted. Okay. Thank you. Good. Remember receiving this text? Yes. I really thought this Easter he would be running everywhere, and he won't be. I'm doing an Easter do-over when he's better. Remember her 
sending you that picture with this text. Four sixty one? Yes. Thank you. Four sixty one. Exhibit table, or are those your copies? No, no. sir. Those are the exhibits. We'll All right. In order. Thank you. You may proceed. That's correct. And you brought the photos that you had taken. That's correct. And you showed them to the ER that day. That's correct. And they diagnosed it as an insect bite. That's correct. And you weren't present for the urgent care visit. That's correct. Or the pediatrician visit. That's correct. But you're aware that they also believed it to be an insect bite. Because of my suggestion to start off with. Yeah. And on the day of the murders, you went down to the station and you talked to Detective Ramirez there. That's correct. And you discussed the spider bite with him. What was suspected to be a spider bite. That's correct. Yeah. And you told him I believe that the doctors suspected a brown recluse? Again, because of what I stated originally. Yeah, and that they couldn't diagnose the type of spider without the insect. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You told Detective Ramirez that the doctors suspected a brown recluse, but they couldn't confirm without seeing the insect. I don't recall that. If you have a video of the playback, I can confirm. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nunes, you may step down. Thank you. Be careful. You, you do you suspect that you're going to call her back uh, for any reason? No, Your Honor. And there's been a request to release her from the rule, and the court is inclined to do so. All right. You are released from the rule, ma'am. You may uh, remain in the courtroom or go back to business. Thank you. However, um, the instruction with regard to talking to anybody else about your testimony that is already a witness, that's going to witness, remains because of the rule against them as opposed to you, okay? okay. Thank you, ma'am. Your next witness. Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. Dr. Antonio Rodriguez, please.
Good afternoon, Dr. Rodriguez. You have been sworn in, is that correct? Yes. Please have a seat right over here, sir, and we'll get started. Good afternoon. Can you please uh, get near the mic and we'll get uh, we'll close to it so that court reporter can, can record your testimony. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start, start off by asking your name. My name is uh, Antonio Rodriguez. Okay, and what is your occupation? I'm a physician. And what kind of physician are you? Pediatrics. Uh, how long have you been practicing uh, medicine? Uh, 26 years in Laredo. Okay. Um, and what does your practice mostly consist of? I see patients from newborn until uh, age 18, sometimes longer. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you if I may approach, uh, Your Honor. The witness. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as patients of age 85. Uh, ask you if you recognize these documents. Yes. Yes, I believe they are. Okay. Are we moved to introduce dates to the eighty five? Okay. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen what State Exhibit 85 is? Uh, these are my uh, medical records, most of them from my office. Okay, and this is uh, regarding who? This is Dominic Hernandez. Okay. And. Uh, Do you recall the first date that, uh, well, let me ask you this. Was Dominic Hernandez one of your patients? Yes. Okay. And uh, do, you, do you remember examining Dominic on or about March the 26th, 2018? I do. Okay. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what the, the reason for your examination of Dominic was? Uh, Dominic came in complaining of uh, pain to, the, to his left eye, I believe and that was after a uh, visit to the uh, emergency room the day before, I believe. Okay, and what, if anything, as far as your protocol, um, is your procedure in, in ascertaining what the problem is? Uh, initially, it was first uh, the patient's history given to me by the mother and also uh, the history that she gave of being seen the day before in the emergency room. Okay. And what, what historical information was was the mother providing for you? Uh, she initially reported that uh, the baby had some inflammation or swelling to the thigh and she was concerned about the pain so she initially took him to the ER and reported to me that at that time the patient was diagnosed with a uh, an insect bite and instructed to follow up in my office uh, if the patient did not improve or just for follow up to make sure that the patient was getting better. Okay. And as far as the, that, that historical information, did you learn that she had had the child outside or at a park or that nature? I believe she told me he was outside. I don't remember she, whether she told me where he was. Okay. Uh, but the suspect was, a, was, a, was an insect? Insect bite, yes. Okay. So what, uh, if anything, um, and let me ask you, would it, would it help you to review or have your notes? Uh, yes, please. Okay. 
Because I know it's been quite a while since I've been down here. I'll be asking you questions from there. Do you remember the demeanor of the baby when you first saw him? I do. He was uh, like a, a lot of babies when they come to me after an ER visit and needing procedures. He was uh, upset and fearful um, initially. Okay. Did you get to uh, ass assess the situation? I did. I did an exam uh, which included his leg but also his uh, general physical exam which included uh, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Okay. Uh, what is it that you uh, ultimately uh, conclude from your examination? I believe my working diagnosis at that time was that Dominic had an uh, in treated insect bite um, after being given an uh, injection of uh, antibiotics one day prior in the ER. Okay. And again, I, I think you, you said that you had um, based your, I guess your diagnosis based on the ER visit and based on what mom was telling you? Correct. And plus the... The, the visual of Correct. the, egg, the baby's it? exam, yes. Okay. Uh, did he have any follow ups with you? I think I saw him uh, three days later. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever have the benefit of uh, Mama? In this case, remember the mother, Griselda Hernandez? I do. Did, did you ever have the, the, the benefit of having her show you some pictures of the injury at the time of the injury? I don't recall her showing me any photos, no. Okay, so, you're right. So, so you, you didn't have that benefit of looking at photos? No. Okay. By the time that you did see the, the, the baby, uh, or even at the second visit, what are you seeing on the leg? Uh, the first visit, uh, there was still some redness there, um, and there was definitely some swelling that I palpated on the exam. Um, during the second visit, the redness had pretty much uh, dissipated uh, or markedly decreased, and then um, the patient's uh, leg swelling had decreased, but mildly. It was still there. Do you remember putting down edema to left thigh? What does that mean? Edema means swelling of the thigh. Okay, and then you put limp with gait. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means uh, as I tried to get him to walk, he would walk, but he would definitely favor that, that side of his leg, that side of his body. Okay, what's, and what's palpation, or, uh, tender to palpation? Uh, that means pain to feeling the area that was uh, hurting him. Now, can you show us what, what do you do uh, to check that with your hands? Sure. Generally, uh, if the baby is cooperative, you just kind of just palpate gently around and then uh, use your fingers to kind of feel around the wound or the swelling area and then go further in to see how deep or how uh, significant the swelling is. Was he reacting to that? Yes. Okay. Um, what about cellulitis to the lower limb? Um, you mean as far as a diagnosis? Yes. What does that mean? That means uh, an infection to the deeper tissues, not just in the upper level of the skin. Okay. Uh, now, what if... Uh, now, again, you said that you did get a reaction from him when you're palpating or touching. Uh, what's the reaction the baby's giving you? Uh, he was crying, pulling back. I believe his... Uh, uh, his mother had to significantly try to calm him and hold him down so I could uh, take a feel of his leg. Okay. Did you order any tests at any time of him uh, or any radiology? Um, I think on the second visit I ordered some blood work and some x-rays. Was there anything significant that came out of that? Um, he showed to have, the x-rays were normal, there was no obvious uh, bony lesions or bony imperfections, there was no sign of infection. Um, the blood work showed some, uh, some moderate, uh, some uh, anemia. 
What does that mean? Uh, low blood count. Okay. Now when you said the x-ray, that was for like bone density or bone injuries, fractures, bone. broken bones? Correct. So there was no broken bone? No. Okay. Um, okay, did you have any uh, concerns uh, during the second visit compared to the first visit uh, with Dominic? Uh, the cons uh, by exam, visual exam, I was relieved that the redness was gone, but his pain seemed to be uh, disproportionate to the how how much it had improved. In other words, his pain was not uh, improving at that time. Ultimately, what was the, the course of treatment that you gave or ordered for, for Dominic? Uh, I believe on the second visit, I uh, placed him on some oral antibiotics to um, hopefully uh, give him a, a treatment to uh, treat a cellulitis that was uh, my working diagnosis at the time. Okay. Now, just to be clear for the jury, looking at your records, you only got to see him two times, right? Two times, yes. Okay. So when the last time you saw him was on April the 4th of 2018? Um, yeah, actually that was the third time. Okay, April the 4th. Are we talking just about uh, this series of visits? Yes. Because... This, yeah, he, just, I'm sorry, just this series of visits regarding the leg injury. Yes, correct. It's two times. Three times. Three times. Okay. 26th, 29th, and I believe the 4th. Okay. And, and that is reflected in your records? Can you check? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the the one of the things that you testified to is what did not what concerned you was that his level of pain um, was not was not uh, appropriate or it, it was not diminishing. Yes. By that time, I would expect it for him to have uh, improvement with both the physical exam and also his uh, level of pain that he was having. Okay. And when was the, uh, so what was your final, you, you ordered blood tests, you, you found them to be a, a little bit of anemia, you said? Yes. What, and what did you end up prescribing for the baby? Uh, at that time I gave him some uh, iron supplementation and usually after placing a baby on iron, I usually see him three to four weeks later to repeat some lab work to make sure that the anemia is responding. Okay. okay. Uh, after April the 4th, did you ever get to see him again? No. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been already admitted. And you did testify that you never got to see photos from uh, taking the day of the injury, correct? No. Okay. I'm going to show you what state exhibit. Four six, four six three. Okay. Do you notice the the color, the dark black round color of the, of the blood? Yes. Okay. You notice that injury? Yes. Okay. And this is. Four six four. Which one were they? I'm sorry. Four six four. And that was four six four, four six three, and I'm gonna also show you four eight four. Okay. Have you ever seen these photos before? No. Can you describe for me in your opinion what type of uh, injuries this is? Uh, it looks like a uh, pinpoint lesion, and I believe that's the thigh. I can't tell because of the closeness, but... How about that? Oh, hold yeah. on, let me back up. Is that the 
dying? Yes. And what is this that's around the, the region? That looks like the level of swelling around that pinpoint lesion. Okay. Could you? Now, when you say. Could I approach real quick on this? was taken on the day of the injury, which is the 25th. We have not seen this one. I see. Correct? No. And 464, which was taken on the 25th. We did not see. He said that never showed these to you. No, I don't I ever saw them in the office, no. Two days after the suspected injury, uh, this other photo was taken. My question to you is on State Secret 44, did you ever show them this photo by D7? No. Now, can you please explain uh, when you say a pinpoint lesion? What is that? Uh, it's a, basically a description of the wound. Uh, basically, a, uh, the way that it looks, you got a sharp or very uh, skinny sharpie and look like a, basically a pinpoint the way it looks. And would, that, would it be fair to say that a pinpoint is uh, uh, consistent with a puncture? Yes, more than likely. That's so what, what I think about when I see a, a baby like that is a, some sort of puncture wound, be it an insect bite uh, uh, or lesion from a, uh, some other source. A, a needle? Uh, yes, a foreign, foreign substance. It could be a pin? Pen, right uh, a safety pin. A safety pin? Yeah. Things, things that break the skin. Sure, break the top level of the skin and goes into the tissue. And out? Yes. Um, but, uh, but in your diagnosis, with what you had at the time, you determined or you went with the course of treatment for an insect bite? Correct. Good afternoon, Doctor. Uh, doctor, you uh, saw Dominic Hernandez on March uh, 26, March 29, and they full form, correct? Yes. And each time your diagnosis was that his injury was caused uh, by spider bite? I believe my working diagnosis was that an insect bite. Insect bite. You also uh, diagnosed him as having Yes. That's an infection, uh, possibly caused by uh, an infected spider bite? Or insect bite, yes. Or really any break in the skin. Okay. Uh, did you also uh, review records from doctor's hospital pertaining to Dominic Hernandez? Uh, at that time? Or at any time between the first and the last time that you saw him? Um, I don't recall that those were available to us at that time. I might have seen them, but I'm not sure. Have you reviewed them at any other time? Uh, I think we had him from VitalNet, I believe. Do those records also indicate that Dominic had an allergic reaction? 
let me let me review this. Um, I see that he was giving Benadryl, but I don't know if they diagnosed him with the uh, with an allergic reaction. Yes, no, I, I don't see that here that he was diagnosed by the med with an allergic reaction. Um, I do see that he was given Benadryl, though. When you first uh, met with Dominic or not this, uh, it's standard procedure to get a, a history of the patient, correct? Yes. And uh, you were told that the emergency room had assessed the injury as a spider bite? Um, I'm not sure if they said spider bite. Um, he was either spider bite or insect bite. And you agreed with that diagnosis, correct? Uh, his working diagnosis was an insect bite. The spider bites and subsequent infections are somewhat common in the radio around uh, March, is that true? Uh, spring, summer for sure, but year round really. Especially with young kids? Yes. And every time that you saw him, you saw him on three occasions, so March 26th, March 29th, and April 4th, 2018. Your treatment that you prescribed was for an insect bite, correct? Insect bite and cellulitis, yes. You also met with uh, police investigators regarding Dominic, Dominic's injury on April 25th of 2023? I believe so. Or would that have been uh, earlier in 2018 that you meet with police? I, I don't recall a specific date. The investigators told you that the medical ex Examiner had found a suspicious puncture wound on Dominic's leg. Do you recall that? Yes, I believe so. But uh, you assessed the injury as an infected uh, insect bite, correct? Yes. And uh, you told uh, the investigating officers that it is common for children to get infected insect bites. Do you recall that? Yes, I believe so. Your diagnosis, your assessment uh, has not uh, changed from the first time that you examined uh, Dominic uh, to, to the present time? Uh, as far as at that time after the third visit? Yes. Yes, my working diagnosis for those three visits was uh, cellulitis. Caused by an insect bite? Yes. And uh, you had no reason to believe that the injury was caused by an injection of any kind, do you? Uh, by history and exam at the time, no. No, isn't it true that spider bites, uh, particularly a brown recluse, can cause anemia? 
Yes. And you also found anemia, you dominate, isn't that correct? Yes. That's all I have, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? You prescribe uh, some strong antibiotics for, for, for Dominic, correct? Yes, on the second visit. Would those, uh, would those have, theoretically, would they have stopped the necrosis from forming? For diagnosis of cellulitis? Yes. Yeah. Yes, once you start appropriate treatment, the tissue actually heals, should heal fairly quickly. You testified earlier that one of the surprises you had was, or one of your concerns was that he, his level of pain continued, or it did not diminish, instead it was persistent, correct? Correct. Um, would you agree that, that, and although you were operating under the premise based on the history given to you by, by the mother that it was a suspected spider bite and that you also, the ER had also talked about an insect bite, that you were comfortable in, in pursuing that protocol? Yes. Uh, did you have any reason at all to suspect uh, a, a pinpoint puncture wound at that time? Uh, no. However, and you were accurate in saying, you, you answered right now to Mr. Peña's questions that based on what you had in front of you at that time, what was the word you used? You were operating or dealing with an in, insect bite, what you say? How do you describe it? Um, working. Working. Working diagnosis? Yes. Correct. The working diagnosis is what you were, what's in front of you, correct? Right. Which can evolve with time depending on whether the patient gets better or not. Okay. Would you agree that based on the, on the spider bites guide that is... Mr. Sonny, could you tell us what uh, exhibit numbers on the document imager? Yes, I'm going to say... Uh, and, and, and I know I didn't ask you this before, but how many pages is on that exhibit? That was three, yes, sir. You asked me before. It's three, three on this exhibit. Uh, three on that one. Thank yes, you. Sir. 147, you said? 497. I'm sorry. 497. Thank you. Okay. This has already previously been brought in, doctor, but this is a spider bite guide. Would you agree with me that in, in most spider bites, there's going to be a manifestation of... of uh, either infection, necrosis, or uh, redness, swelling around the bite itself? Yes. And that that was not present in, in or only maybe perhaps some of these symptoms were present in Dominic's case? Yeah, he had redness, he had swelling, um, and that was approximately about 24 hours after he had been treated with uh, antibiotics in the emergency room, I believe. Did you see any in, uh, necrosis around, is it common that around a spider bite wound or bite that you will begin to develop the necrosis or cellulitis on the upper dermis of the skin? Uh, with uh, that or any bug bite, you're going to get swelling, you're going to get uh, redness, especially the first 24 to 48 hours. Although I'm, no, I'm not an expert on spider bites, but brown reclusers are famous for causing significant tissue necrosis within hours, not day or two or three days later. But, and, and that's good you say that because none of that was present in Dominic's case. No. He had swelling. He had redness. And redness. And the pain. And pain. Those are the three things he had. And that was the working, what you say? Working, working diagnosis. That was your working diagnosis that you had, right? Right. What eventually happened to your patient? Did you come to find out what happened to your little patient? I did. And what is that? I learned that he was uh, killed okay. on the news, I believe. Yeah. And did you come to find out uh, afterwards in, in meeting with law enforcement uh, that there were needles found in 
in the property belonging to the suspect. Uh, yes, I believe I was told that. Knowing what you learned after the fact, the information that law enforcement provided to you after the needles, does that does that change the working diagnosis that you're dealing with? Uh, it, sir, it changes it and it broadens it, of course. It, it what? Broadens it. It makes me think of other things besides a cellulitis or an insect bite. What does it make you think about? It makes me think of trauma. That maybe something was something broke the skin. Yes. Something punctured that skin. Yes. Something other than a spider bite. Correct. No further questions. Uh, just a few questions before we move on. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, when you say that uh, learning that a hypodermic needle was found in the belongings of uh, Mr. Borgos, that made you think of uh, other possibilities. That's not a conclusion that you reach. You said it's just uh, something else that you consider. Correct. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Step down, and I believe that we are releasing you from uh, any further testimony. You may go about your business. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go in and take a, um, a real quick break, bathroom break, and then come right back and get started again. Thank you.
para que no hagamos dos levantadas. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Dr. Stern, long time no see. How are you? Are you on? Are you on? Okay. Please raise your right hand and be sworn. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you go. I do. Thank you, Doc. You may have a seat over here. The jury's going to come in in a minute, in a second, hopefully. Ms. Anish, your next witness is? Dr. Colleen Stern, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Stern has been sworn in and she's is seated. Please proceed when ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state your name for the record? Dr. Corrine Stern. What is your occupation? I'm the Chief Medical Examiner for Webb County, Texas. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about your educational background and your training that qualifies you in this uh, field as a medical examiner? Sure. I received my undergraduate degree in medical technology from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor in Belton. I graduated from medical school at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth. I have a master's degree in public health. I went to medical school at the University, did that, did my residency at um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu. Um, I then did a surgical pathology fellowship with the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, and I did my forensic medicine fellowship with the Office of the Armed Forces Medical Examiner in Washington, D.C. I am uh, licensed to practice medicine in the state of Texas. I passed my forensic boards in 2001. I'm a member of the National Association of Medical Examiners and the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. What is forensic pathology? Sure, so forensic means law. So I practice pathology or practice medicine as it deals with the law. And uh, as, as in your capacity as a medical examiner, do you perform autopsies? Yes. And what is an autopsy? So an autopsy is a complete exam, both external, the outside, and internal, the inside of the human body. How long have you been the medical examiner in Webb County? About 16 and a half years now. Okay, so is it fair to say you've conducted many, many uh, autopsies? Yes. Okay. Um, have you testified before as an expert witness in forensic pathology? Yes. Okay. On, on how many occasions? Um, a few, many? Many. Okay. And uh, I'm going to kind of take you back to the year of 2018. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you, do you, 
I know you have an office. Uh, can you describe the the structure of your office as far as your personnel, um, investigators, and things? What typically happens when the medical examiner office uh, gets called on a uh, on a dead body? Okay, so we're a full service medical examiner's office. Um, I have a full staff. I'm uh, the only, currently the only medical examiner there. I have a staff of full-time and part-time medical death investigators, uh, full and part-time autopsy technicians, and also my office staff. So in the state of Texas, certain deaths under the statutes have to be reported to the medical examiner. And when those are reported, um, we usually send an investigator out to the scene to investigate that death and also to make pronouncement. Um, if it is a very suspicious death or thought that it might be a homicide and I'm here local, then I will go out on those scenes as well. Now, um, do you, <coughs> I know you have a staff, but do you still on, on occasion go out in the field? Yes. Um, and um, do, do you recall responding to a crime scene uh, back in the date of April the 9th of 2018. Yes, I did. Okay, you can tell the lady and gentleman jury, where is it that you personally responded to that day? I believe it was Father McNay Park is where we were called. Um, we did receive that call. Uh, it was a suspicious death, thought to be a homicide, and so I did report out to the scene with my investigator. Okay, uh, and if you can <coughs> walk us through Walk the jury through what happens when you get there on, on, on that day of April the 9th. Well, the first thing that happens is um, we coordinated with the detective that was out on the scene. That's protocol for us to get some background on the scene and also to uh, get clearance to actually walk into the crime scene so we don't disturb any evidence. Um, our main goal at that point is to pronounce the decedents. Um, and that's what I did. Um, we were uh, brought over to a female victim, and I believe I made pronouncement on her death. Okay. Um, do you remember the, the location uh, in Father Magdalene Park? Was it? Was it? Uh, in it was not in a. She was in an open area, maybe on the side of a road or a trail, from what I just remember um, of that day. Um, and she was just lying out in the open. Okay. Uh, do you remember her position, how she was? I believe she was prone, which means face down. I believe that is how she was found. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, is, what are some of the first things you, you do when you, when, you, um, when you see her? So I make pronouncement and then um, we always get permission from the law enforcement there if it's okay to move her, and they did need to take some photographs, so um, we did move her into different positions so they could photograph both her front and her back. Okay, and are you uh, equipped with a camera at your office? Oh yes, we take all our own photographs as well, that's correct. Okay. Um, were you able to identify the female in this case? Um, I, I don't recall off the top of my head whether she had already been identified. Um, by the time we did send her for autopsy, she, she had been identified, uh, but I just can't recall um, at the scene. Um, I do remember somebody had been looking for her, and I believe her vehicle was out there, and so they had a good idea at that time who she was. Uh, and uh, you guys take a bunch of photos? Yes, we take a lot of photographs. Okay, can I approach on it? Yeah. Okay. Now, how many subjects uh, were we dealing with that day? How many deceased? Two. Two. Who was the first uh, subject? Was it a male or a female? It was, the, it was a female. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been already previously admitted as State's Exhibit 193. 194, 196, and 197. You can just look at those, those are already in evidence. Okay. Do you remember those photos? 
I don't independently recollect the actual photographs, but yes, these were photographs uh, that were taken there at the scene. Okay. And do you know who's handling the, the body here? Um, that would be my investigator. Okay. And were you present? Yes, absolutely. I probably took those photographs. So you're in charge of the scene? Yes. If I'm out there, I absolutely. Okay. Um, Dr. this is uh, 193. 194, 196, 197. These are graphic photos that I'll be putting up. For members of the family. What do we see in States Exhibit 193? This is Griselda Hernandez. And um, my investigator has a hold of her hand, of one of her arms, I believe her right arm. What, are there any injuries sustained for this arm? Yes, there are injuries. Um, this dark area, you see, um, if you'll follow the, the blue gloved finger and go towards the right of the photograph and you come to a dark crescent shaped injury. Um, that's what we call a, a sharp force injury or an incised injury. Um, well, you know, I'm going to ask the judge if she can come off the stand so she can show the jury. Yes, go ahead. Can you come down? Towards the court uh, reporter and the jury. Okay. So she can that point it. Okay, if you can just uh, face the jury and, and make sure the court reporter can hear you, I'm going to give you this pen in order to describe the injuries that the jury can see on there. Oh, okay. okay. Without writing on it, just. Right. Uh, now, now I understand what you're asking. Okay, so I'm talking about this injury right here, okay? So this is a sharp force injury. Um, just If you were just looking at the photograph without having seen the autopsy report, I can tell you it's a sharp force injury, so caused with something with some kind of sharp blade. It's not a tear, it's more like a cut, if you will, in layman's terms. Um, the rest of this you're seeing uh, sand. This is sand and dirt from the ground that you're seeing here. Um, and obviously blood that you're seeing in the other areas. What about here? Yes, so yes. Okay, so right here, again, you can see another dark, a little bit of a crescent-shaped area, the same thing. It, it's a cut, if you will. At this point, hard to describe it any further on this photograph. Can't, looks like dried blood here. I can't tell from this photograph. I'm gonna show you now 194. Okay, this is Griselda's left hand. Um, you're seeing an, a sharp force injury here, also at the base of the thumb here. Um, and you're seeing just the edge of one right here. I'm gonna show you now 196. So I believe in this photograph, this is a close-up, so it's a little harder to orient on this photograph. This is obviously her hair, so this is towards her head. This is towards her feet. Um, this appears to be a shoulder area here. Um, this is not the chest area. I'm, I'm trying to see which way she's turned. Okay, 
this looks like an ear big ear. Okay, so this is her ear. This is her ear. So this will help orient it. The helix of her ear, the cartilaginous part of the ear, and her hair. So she is already turned over, and, and I guess we're looking at her chest area. And right here, you see um, a sharp wound right here. I'm also going to show you. Okay, so I believe here, this is part of her clothing. Um, it probably looked like a bra strap here, her hair. So I think we're looking, is this her neck? It looks like this is her mouth, right? Yes, nose. yes, so we're looking at a jawline right here. Um, so uh, in the neck area, and you're seeing a cluster of sharp force injuries. Uh, these are consistent in this photograph with stab wounds. What's what <coughs> valuable or what what how can I say this? Uh, what vital what vital uh, structures structures so are are under the under that neck right there? Uh, pretty much our lifeline. We have our carotid artery that runs in here. You also have smaller jugular vein, jugular artery, but the carotid artery is the one we are most concerned with when we have injuries to this part of the neck. Okay. And she's got one directly in the in the area. Of, yes. Of where the jugular vein is. The jugular and and the carotid, if it's deep enough, the carotid sits much deeper, um, but is in that area. And I know it was out in the field. Uh, were you were you able to get a guesstimate of how many stab wounds she had on her? She had multiple. She had multiple stab wounds. It, um, because of the amount of blood, she did lose a lot of blood externally as opposed to internally. Um, so it was very hard to tell out in the field. How much blood was there out on that dirt trail? A lot. A lot. She bled externally. Okay, you said there was also another deceased uh, person at this scene, correct? Yes. And, and tell the jury who you found. So, I found her son. Mm -hmm. um, what was his name? Dominic. Okay. And can Dominic. you describe his condition, Dominic's condition? He was in the brush. Um, I carried him out of the brush. Um, what I first noticed is he had an injury to his neck. Um, okay. Again, appeared to be a sharp force type injury as opposed to a blunt force type injury. You're seeing it on the left side of his neck. Also in that area that we're very concerned with uh, where the carotid artery runs. This injury to Dominic uh, could that be a fatal injury? Yes. This and it, it's almost the same injury that his mother had. It's in the same area as that cluster of stab wounds that she had to her neck. So ultimately, that stab wound to her artery, her jugular vein, would have killed her also. Yes, without immediate medical attention. Do you remember uh, any other injuries that this little baby had to his body? Yes. I pulled up his shirt and he had a sharp force injury to his chest. Okay. Well, describe that injury that you saw was in his chest. Again, um, a sharp force injury um, consistent with having been caused with something with a blade on it, what we call in layman's terms a cut, not a blunt force injury, but a sharp force injury. Uh, would that be fair to say that it would have been above the heart or around the heart Yes, area? in the area of, of where the heart is underneath. Okay. Um, Which one? The one that off. That shows that mm -hmm. I'm going to show you 456, States Exhibit 456. This is how I found him. Okay. Um, and what do we see here? So he is lying supine, which is just a fancy word, which means on the back. Um, and you see the injury to the left side of his neck that we saw up close in the other photograph. Um, 
I pulled up his shirt right there because I was concerned with the amount of what appeared to be blood on the front of his shirt. Well, it was interesting that you did you observe any cuts uh, or holes in the shirt? I can't remember. I just can't recall. Um, and do you remember him having uh, a lot of blood also? Well, in, in the area, not not to the degree that his mother had, but his, his clothing was saturated. Two wounds. Two yes, wounds. that I could see at that time to okay. the neck and to the center of his chest. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Say you found her in a, uh, is it a prone position, you said? Is that? Yes. And that means face down? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been introduced already as 186. This is how she, that, this is how you found her? Yes. Now, are, are you uh, familiar with the term lividity? Yes. Uh, and can you please explain what that means, doctor? So lividity is the settling of blood after somebody dies. And so your blood will settle to the dependent portions. So somebody who dies on their back, the lividity, the discoloration will be on the back. And if somebody dies face down or on the abdomen, we'll see the lividity on the front, except in areas exposed to pressure. Because what lividity is, is blood pools in the, in the vessels. And so after somebody dies, you see all that blood pooling um, is like a reddish purple discoloration of the skin. One of the first things we do when we get to a scene is we take our thumb and we press it in that lividity. And if you've ever had a sunburn and you press it really hard, it turns white, it blanches. So we want to see if the lividity is blanching. So if the lividity is blanching, that means the lividity is unfixed. And so the decedent's probably been dead less than six to eight hours. If we press into the lividity and it's fixed, it doesn't blanch, then the decedent's probably been dead more than six to eight hours. There are not a lot of things that affect lividity, so it's really the best tool we have at the time of the scene to put the time of death in, in a certain time frame. I'm going to show you what states exhibit uh, 413 uh, based on your ex, and this has already been admitted also based on your expert opinion. Can you tell us what this appears to be? Well, this photograph's kind of difficult because of the way the light. Um, this was taken at the Nueces County Medical Examiner. Nope, it's. Can you come? It's uh, not your light. It's oh, it is your light. <laughs> it is a light. Yes. So there's a glare. Right at the autopsy. There's a glare, and, and that's why, yes. uh, Your Honor, if you can step down because it's distorted. But okay, can you see? Yeah. So there's no lividity to her back. Okay, because she didn't die on her back. She died face down. Mm -hmm. Now, if the lividity is not fixed, and you turn the individual before it's fixed, it will shift. Okay, and it did not shift. So um, the lividity was probably fixed at the time of, uh, that she was found. I so what does this, this indicate? Would she have been on her back or on her side? This, this is well, she could have been a little bit to her right side, and uh, depending on, on how her skin folded, we can see some lividity there. Uh, that's not concerning. What's concerning is here that she doesn't have lividity to her back. So she may have been on one yeah, side. Yeah, she may have, may have been a little bit to more to one side than the other. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
This is another picture, Your Honor, that's also graphic, and you described the injury. Uh, you said that baby Dominic had to his sternum. Is that? Yes, to the mid portion of his chest. I'm going to show you there four four fifty one. And is that the injury that you said was a puncture? That's a stab wound. That's a stab wound. And what uh, what kind of object would cause that type of stab wound? Something consistent with a knife. We can see uh, the majority of stab wounds we see are caused by knives, but um, we can see them with screwdrivers or other sharp objects. But the point is it's a sharp force injury. Now, the full autopsy, um, was it performed by you in this case? No, it was not. Okay, what, what if anything did you do with the bodies? So, um, I had an obligation to speak at a Border Patrol conference that next day, and because of the severity um, of these deaths, um, we didn't want to postpone the autopsies, and so um, I have a colleague in Corpus Christi that will cover for me when I'm out. So we did transport the decedents to our office. Um, they were put in cold refrigeration and then transported in the morning to the uh, Nueces County Medical Examiner's Office in Corpus Christi. And just for the record, you did did you did you did pronounce uh, Griselda Hernandez dead? Yes. And you did pronounce Dominic Alexander Hernandez dead. Yes. Um, and based on your experience, what was the cause of the death? Uh, multiple sharp force injuries or multiple stab wounds. Would this be fair to be described as a homicide? Oh, yes, sir. Did, at any time did you uh, receive so the bodies go to Dr. Fernandez? Yes. And what happens after he performs the autopsies? My investigators stay, uh, an autopsy text from our office stayed with the decedents while they, they were there. When the autopsies were finished, they brought him back to my office. And then you, uh, you, prep, you prep the bodies once they're here for, or to be? Yes, they were prepped all, yeah, they were prepped, meaning we clean them and uh, make sure they're ready to be released to the funeral home. So they were brought back to our office. Uh, while we awaited for the family to make funeral arrangements. And that was going to be done in this case? Yes. Uh, prior to doing that, do you ever remember coming into contact with, with an Angelica Hernandez? Yes. Uh, how <coughs> did you come back into contact with her? Angelica is Dominic's aunt, and um, she showed up at my office. I. I believe it was on the Friday morning um, after they had come back and she had requested to speak to me, which I did, um, and she had some concerns about Dominic. Okay. Is that unusual? For something it's like not that? very common for that to happen. Okay. And what was, what, what was her main concern? That um, a couple of weeks prior to this that Dominic had sustained some type of injury and she wanted to know if I, I could put a second set of eyes on him and look at it um, and give my opinion on it. Okay. And when you say second set of eyes, that's to give it another exam, another look at? Yes. And what specifically was she, she concerned with? So she had some photographs she had taken on her cell phone uh, about an injury on one of Dominic's thighs. Um, and that's what she was concerned with. It was um, what she described as a puncture type wound. Um, and I agreed to pull him out and take a look at it. Okay, I'm going to show you what's already been in, uh, introduced as State's Exhibit 484. Is that consistent with what you're just describing? Yes. And 484.1? Yes. Okay, and she also had uh, 463, 
Yes. Um, so you pull, you go back and you pull baby Dominic out? Yes. And what, if anything, do you do if you could tell the jury? So I look at the, this is the front or the anterior surface of his left thigh. Um, and I look to see if I can see a wound there. Um, Dr. Fernandez obviously has already seen that because he had made an incision into that area. Do you remember her, the, her at all indicating to you what, if anything, the initial impression was of that wound? Yes, they uh, uh, thought this was a spider bite. Uh, she did explain to me as soon as Dominic, um, as soon as they saw it, uh, and I believe he was being fussy about it. it. It was painful that they immediately took him to get some medical attention. So he had, she relays to you that two weeks earlier, he, they, he experiences what they thought was a spider bite, but now that he's dead, she's concerned that it's not. That's correct. What, if anything, do you find uh, con uh, regarding this concern? So when I look at the wound, it appears to be a puncture wound. Um, my first impression, it looks like an injection site. Um, that's just what it looks like, like something caused by the bore of a needle. Um, I cut further into this wound and the tissue down deep into the muscle was necrotic. That means it was dead. Okay, so you, you cut, you make, you go into the, the thigh deep and make a cut? Yes. And when you say it's, how do you know it's dead? Um, how does it, how well, because does it, I know what necrotic tissue looks like. It's, how does it's, it look? It's black. It's a deep purple black. It's dead tissue. I ended up blocking out the whole skin with the wound down deep into the muscle and I kept um, the big incisional biopsy, put it in my negative 80 degree freezer where it still sits today. And based on your experience at this time, is it looking like a spider bite? No, it is not. You say that he has necrosis of subcutaneous tissue. Can you explain to the jury what that means? That just means the tissue underneath the skin. So uh, right underneath the skin, um, when the initial incision was made by uh, Dr. Fernandez, he saw hemorrhage, a hematoma. It um, just means like a bruise underneath the skin. If you've ever had blood drawn before and then it gets puffy and blue, um, something similar to that, but I went much deeper down in, into the tissue um, and below that area the, the muscle was necrotic. Did you see anything uh, that would have resembled, and I'm going to show you what's been introduced already as 497, anything that would have resembled, you know, spider bite infection? On the surface. No, this isn't a spider bite. There is nothing on the skin surrounding this wound. All the damage to the tissue is subcutaneous. If you have a spider bite from a brown recluse, uh, you get a lot of necrotic skin. You actually see it on the skin. And um, what it's called like a developing um, wound, if you will. It starts in the center and it just gradually goes out and gets bigger and bigger. There wasn't anything on the outside of his of his skin. Um, we think of um, black widow bite, um, the same thing. We, we're going to see something on the outside of the skin and I have to put my glasses. Yeah, so it's just showing you black widow brown recluse bites. Um, by the way, you rarely die from these, uh, but you can be very, very ill from them. Um, but absolutely no indication that there was any kind of trauma to the outside of the skin. And sometimes, especially in, like in a black widow bite, you can see the two little fang marks. Mm -hmm. And he definitely did not have that. Well, on uh, 49.1, it's consistent with what you just described more as a puncture, not a puncture. It's, it's a puncture wound. Okay, so... This is blown up, just so you realize. This is, you're looking at a very magnified photograph. Um, once, you, once you have this information and this opinion, uh, what, do you, what do you do? What action do you take, if any? So I asked her where she initially took uh, Dominic and uh, where his mom had taken 
Dominic and uh, what did they do? And initially she told me they did take him to doctor's hospital and they did draw some blood. So I picked up the phone and called doctor's hospital to see if they still had his blood sample and unfortunately they did not. Too much time had uh, elapsed. So given the fact that the injury was 15 days prior, the blood that they had drawn from him was gone. That's correct. Um, there was um, really nothing further that could be tested, correct? That's correct. Um, now, given your expertise and saying that this is a puncture wound, what would more than likely be the culprit or the cause? That he was injected with something. Okay. Do you ever remember uh, talking to the detectives in this case and giving them instructions? I, I did, and I told them this looked to me to be consistent with a large bore needle. Um, and did they find any evidence um, at the scene of any large bore needles? Okay. Did you come to find out that in his personal belongings they found needles? In mentioned? whose personal belongings? In the personal belongings of Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles? Yes. I was told later. Okay. And based on your on your recommendation, do you can you describe what this is? That's a syringe. Okay, so that's what we attach the needle to. So that's where the liquid goes in? Yes. Whatever liquid you're gonna inject. And what is this? That's a large bore needle. By the color of it, it should be an 18 gauge, but sometimes we see them, it's um, across the industry, everything's color coded. Um, so that's probably an 18 gauge needle. Okay. And States Exhibit 352. And I'll, 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 if I can approach the witness, because sure. the uh, mayor there, but he's a clear human person. Oh, yes. Okay, so this is a syringe, and it appears to have a needle already on this one. This is a large bore needle. When you say this, can you describe the number of the exhibits? I'm sorry. Uh, exhibit, uh, States Exhibit 352. Is a, it looks like a three mil syringe with a needle attached. What size of needle? This is a, I can't tell by looking at this, I'm sorry. Okay, but then, nonetheless, there is a needle. Yes. And what about on uh, states 351? Um, so, um, this is just the needle. This appears to be an 18 gauge needle. And what does that mean for the jury? It's a large bore needle. In other words, um, the tip of the needle that goes in is, is large, as opposed to a teeny tiny needle like uh, in a tuberculin syringe that you put under your skin, a tiny needle. This is a very large needle, such as the type of needle we use to draw blood after somebody dies. Could either, <coughs> could either type of these needles, any any needle of this type uh, caused the subcutaneous necrosis that you saw? It can cause the bleeding, the bruising, but it's uh, the needle itself is not going to cause necrosis unless it's contaminated with something. So in other words, whatever liquid may have been inside the syringe? More than likely caused this. Okay. But just to be clear, uh, there was never any uh, detection or analysis done to determine what, if anything, was injected in That's the correct. Okay, just that he suffered a puncture. That's correct. Okay. Now, I know you removed the, the, the portion of that square of skin, right? Did you try to send it anywhere to get tested? Well, we have to know what to test it for. It is still sitting in the minus 80 degree freezer. We, there's thousands of things we could test for. Um, 
and it's not feasible. We consumed the whole specimen, so we needed some something, um, some index of suspicion of some substance to be able to test it, and that was never found. So in other words, there was never a substance to be able to compare it to, to ask to look for. That's correct. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith. How are you? I'm Good. Dr. You mentioned that uh, you first uh, came into contact uh, with Madame Fernandez because she contacted you? That's correct. Do you recall approximately what day that was? I believe just off the top of my head it was a Friday morning. So it would have been maybe the Friday morning after he died. He was already back at my office and I was already back in town, but it was early in the morning. Uh, well, that would have been maybe uh, about five days after the murder? I don't think it was that long, but somewhere in the neighborhood I would say of three days maybe. Okay. And uh, prior to your examination of the wound on uh, Dominic Red, yeah, she was concerned that he may have been injected in his thigh. Did you review the medical records of Dr. Antonio Rodriguez pertaining to Dominic uh, Wong? Yes, eventually. I didn't. We did not have them at that point, but eventually, yes, we did obtain his medical records. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez's diagnosis was that the wound was caused by an insect bite, correct? That's correct. And uh, did you have occasion to review the medical records from the doctor's hospital pertaining to Dominic? Uh, yes, we did receive those as well. And uh, the physician at the doctor's hospital also diagnosed that the wound as an insect bite? That's correct. Would you disagree with those? I dis I, I dis after I saw the wound myself, I tend to disagree with that diagnosis because there is no reaction on the skin itself. Okay. And you took a tissue sample, correct? Yes, sir. Did you ever do any type of uh, testing, toxicology testing? No, sir. Any type of analysis? No, sir. So you cannot uh, tell this jury that scientific testing shows that there was uh, tissue consistent with an in injection rather than an insect bite, correct? Right, I cannot tell you that. And you cannot tell this jury that the tissue uh, shows the presence of some foreign substance uh, that was injected into that site, correct? That's correct. I cannot tell you that. Uh, all you can really tell the jury is uh, what a medic told you that she thought the wound was. And uh, your opinion based on your visual observation of the wound, correct? Yes. My opinion that it's an injection is solely my opinion based on my exam of the wound. Board, uh, what, what exactly were you referring to? The American Academy of Foren the American Academy, the American Board of Pathology, uh, my forensic medicine boards given by the American Board of Pathology. I see. So, so uh, what date did you get certified? It was in 2001. That's correct. At uh, one point, you worked as a medical examiner in Alabama? Yes. Well, what year uh, did that period of time cover, Dr. Smith? That was from 2006, the very end of 2005, and almost to the end of 2006. I was there for about 14 months.
approach, please.
Um, I have to continue this conversation. I'm going to I'm going to try and take about five or ten minutes max, but I need to do it without you all being present. So um, if it takes any longer, I'll, I'll call you back in. So we'll Thank you. All right, please have a seat. One second. The objection, or I guess the anticipation from the state uh, was that you were, you were getting ready to uh, attempt to impeach the witness with, and that's the point, uh, I guess Mr. Alanis believed that you were ready to impeach the witness with, um, uh, factual findings that were in fact incorrect with regard to her work at um, at a previous uh, uh, position that she held I think she just described it uh, in Alabama and, uh, and and that you wanted to get into that and uh, could, could you I guess I'm, I'm prefacing uh, where we left off on the objection uh, so that you could, in fact, tell us uh, where you intend to go. I wanted to have this conversation outside of the presence of the jury, and then we'll take it from there. What do you want to be able to get into with regard to uh, this witness? And on top of that, the witness is here, by the way. But uh, So um, I, I left her here just because there may be some testimony that we take from here so that I can make a decision, and then we'll take it from there. So if you want to preface your, uh, your line of questioning or perhaps you want to be able to get into it with her now before, okay. And then we'll decide whether that line of questioning comes in or not. Let's go. And of course, now you can make your objections uh, freely because the jury's not present. And so this would be the topic of uh, conversation or the impeachment portion of his cross-examination that he would like to get into, and the court will make a ruling on that, uh, on the appropriateness of that or not. Go ahead. Dr. Stern, uh, with all due respect to you, you worked on a case in Alabama relating to a woman named Bridget Bean, correct? I'm not sure. I know what case you're talking about, but I don't. That's so long ago, I don't remember her name. You don't remember the name? Yeah. But it was a case where a woman was charged with death of murder based on um, your opinion that she had uh, strangled or suffocated the child, correct? It was a fetus. Well, an infant. It lived for, yeah. And uh, that case was dismissed subsequently because six different medical examiners determined that the child was actually stillborn. Isn't that correct, Dr. Street? 
Yeah, well, I didn't have, I wasn't privy to the, to the defense, to the other reports of, of what they found. Um, that was my last case that I performed before I left the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences. And uh, what, what was the reason for your uh, leaving your job as a forensic medical examiner in Alabama? We were miserable there. My son and I were miserable in Alabama. Should never left the state of Texas. That was the only reason. It had nothing really to do with my job other than we wanted to come back home. Did you resign or were you terminated? Oh, no, I resigned. Okay. Now, these uh, six forensic experts agreed that the child actually died of pneumonia uh, rather than uh, uh, being strangled. Isn't that correct? Um, I believe that's the conclusion they came to, but the child would have had to live to develop pneumonia, so I, I just... I, I haven't seen their reports or anything, but I, I have heard that they came up with a diagnosis of pneumonia. And uh, those six medical examiners all agree that what you saw from the bruises were actually signs of decomposition of the body. I don't know. Again, I don't, I, I've never seen the reports, but I do know there was a disagreement as to why that the fetus or the child died, the infant. So, Ms. Anais, what she was not. part of that is not, you're saying is uh, not supported by whatever transcript you have there? I think it's a mischaracterization of what took place in Alabama, and I think I don't think it's relevant. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about specifically Mr. Pena is stating that there was a case that was dismissed and that largely was dismissed based on, I think he said six uh, medical examiners. Uh, was it really medical examiners or coron whatever, coron what, I don't know the difference because sometimes when you're the official medical examiner, you have whole, sort of like a court reporter, like when you're the official court reporter, you actually work for the court when you're the um, official medical examiner of a county you work for a particular county right and i the, alabama is a corner jurisdiction corner. most of the state I so i'm not medical. sure who's okay. objecting to it so in any event there was a um, and and so as a result of that so so is there anything that was said in the questioning by mr peña that in fact is contrary to what you believe the facts are Again, I'm asking whether there's anything contrary to what he said. Uh, yes, there is a, uh, I think there's, there's some uh, distinction from what, what he said. In essence, the case was dismissed, it was dismissed, and I guess I can clarify that it was dismissed by the, arbitrarily by the district attorney, not by the court. Yeah. And it was done upon the, upon the district attorney's own motion after the defense had hired some medical examiners to tender some, that they tendered some medical autopsy opinions to the DA's office, mm -hmm. ultimately the, the DA taking the side of the, of the defense attorneys on that case, seeking some other, I guess, uh, opinions at the same time, which Mr. Peña is right, it was a, a total of six. She was never found or disciplined. It was, in essence, a difference of opinions. And at the end of the day, the district attorney in Alabama unilaterally and arbitrarily decided to dismiss the case on, on his own motion. Um, I mean, if it's like Texas, the only way you can, I guess, dismiss a case is through a he, there was DA's a, office motion. Yes, and it was, it was done by the district attorney uh, on, on his own. And I have a transcript of the hearing here. District Attorney justifies the reasons that why he, he 
he dismissed the case, but Dr. Stern was never found to have committed any, no. anything wrong. She was never disciplined by any board. She was never found to have committed any malpractice. Uh, and in fact, at the end of the day, was was clear. Um, so I think the thing here is that it's an attempt to mis mischaracterize and attack her, her uh, uh, unfairly attack Dr. Stern's credibility on, on a set of facts that um, that is not relevant in this case. So uh. that's what it comes down to. Okay, uh, I, I get that, and you know. The, the, quite frankly, this is, you know, one of the reasons that uh, few people uh, become experts and, yep. and are okay becoming experts and testifying in court and taking on cases, uh, uh, you know, for a reason. Primarily, it's because every time you become an expert, on the other side, there's another expert, and they're going to attack your findings and with all sorts of things. And 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 um, fortunately, that's the uh, nature of of the beast. Uh, when when you have a skill and a expertise and whatever and you give an opinion such uh, that is given in almost every case where there's a doctor that testifies and uh, and they're subject to to uh, to whatever it is and I, I, I can't especially in this situation can't uh, cannot sustain your objection and I'll allow the uh, as long as it's within the parameters of what you said earlier I think dr. Stern you know testifies and you know explains exactly what it is that she had in her possession when she made her decisions and what they may have had in her possession that in fact could change her opinion. So in fact, it, it goes to the weight of it as opposed to, and we'll let the jury decide whether or not uh, the justification for, similarly to, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, I guess with Rodriguez or Ramirez, what was it that came in today? He said, I had a working uh, diagnosis with regard to what this was. You're going to come, Dr. Stern, and says, you know, it was something different because she had different information. In any event, all right, good. Let's proceed. Let's get the jury back in. I don't want to have to bring Dr. Stern tomorrow. I don't know if she doesn't want to come. Yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it. I'll just Can you let him know? I don't know. We're going to have to get them together because I'm sure some people went to the restroom, so it might take us a few minutes. I'm going to stay right here and uh, continue uh, as soon as the jury is ready to come in. We'll get them in. <laughs> EJ and Rachel. You stood up for EJ. Thank you all. Please have a seat and let us continue with the examination. Mr. Pena. Thank you. 
Excuse me? Okay. The last question was merely how long you, she had been in Alabama. I'm not sure you're talking about the one before that. I think it was just uh, prefacing their previous questions. Thank you. Well, um, you stated that you don't recall the woman's name, uh, Dr. Stern, but you do recall the case where a woman was charged with capital murder of her newborn child based on your diagnosis. Um, That's correct, yes. Yeah. And then uh, the case was subsequently dismissed because there were six different medical examiners that determined that the child was actually stillborn rather than strangled or suffocated, correct? Well, that's right. I, I, again, I don't know if they were medical examiners or coroners, but yes, whoever reviewed it, yes. And uh, are you aware that the district attorney who dismissed the case said that he would never have brought the case against her if he had been provided the correct facts from the beginning? I'm going to object before she asks no. that question. Right. She's already answered, but sustained. Go ahead. Are you aware that the, the judge who dismissed the case said in 30 years of law practice he had never seen an expert make a mistake so bad? Mr. Uh, approach, please. Stern, you have stated that you did not conduct the autopsies on any of the victims in this case, uh, correct? That's correct. And um, Angelica came uh, to your office uh, sometime around April 12, 2018, more than? Several days after um, Dominic and his mom died. 
And prior to that day, every medical personnel that examined the Dominic Gillespie injury was consistent with an insect bite. Isn't that correct? Well, I don't know that because I had not talked to the medical examiner who had performed the autopsy. You did not think it was important to see whether he agreed with your opinion or not? Well, I may have talked to him subsequently, but I'm telling you at the time that she came and had me look at it, I had not spoken to him yet. Wouldn't it be a standard protocol to do toxicology testing in a situation uh, such as you have described where a medical professional is describing the wound as an insect bite and you have the contrary opinion that it's actually a wound caused by a hypodermic needle? Well, we couldn't, we didn't have a blood sample to test. I did call the hospital to see if they had that original blood sample on Dominic, but they had disposed of it. And without knowing what to test on the tissue, there's thousands of things. Uh, the law enforcement needs to come forward and say, hey, we found this, or we think it may be X, Y, or Z, and then we test for X, Y, or Z, or we're going to consume the whole, whole sample and still not know um, what might have um, caused it. But you did have the tissue sample that you excised from the wound, correct? Yes, sir, I still have it. And yet it was never tested? We don't have anything to, to test for. We don't know what to test for. My lab probably tests for tens of thousands of substances, if not a hun hundreds of thousands. We have to know something, we have to know what we need to look for. When you test tissue, you have to homogenize it. So you take a piece of it and you, it's, um, the easiest way to explain it is like you blend it until it's in a liquid and then you test that liquid and it consumes the sample. If we test for five things and it's not any of them and then they find something and now we don't have any sample to test for what we needed. And that's why that sample hasn't been tested. We just, we don't want to guess. So right now all we can say is he has a puncture wound and that's what I've testified. He has a puncture wound. A puncture wound uh, caused by some unknown object, not necessarily by hypodermic needle? It could be by something else. I'm just saying it's consistent with. That's what it looks like to me. And that's what I asked when I saw it. I said, well, that looks like a large bore needle, in, you know, injection site. And, and I spoke with the detectives and sent them to look for something like that. And that is what they came up with. But yes, it could have been caused by something else. Absolutely. So you're not telling this jury that in your opinion that puncture wound was caused by an 18 gauge or any gauge hypodermic needle? Correct? That's correct. I'm saying it's consistent with that. But you don't really know what caused it. That's correct. I do not know. Professor Witness, you want to? The fact remains that you did ask the detectives to look for a needle, correct? That's correct. And they did find a needle, correct? Yes, sir. And in possession of Ronald Anthony Burgos Avenus' personal belongings, correct? Yes, sir. Now, References made to this case from the state of Alabama in 2009. A district attorney by the name of J. Chris McCool arbitrarily and on his own motion went to court and dismissed the case, correct? Uh, that's correct. Objection, Your Honor. That's not a question. That's an argument. He opened the door. I'm just asking these questions. All right. She can answer him. She can answer him. Correct? That's correct. And he did this after a, a defense attorney by the name of James Standridge went and got a <coughs> his own medical e examiners to give their own opinions against yours, correct? That's correct. Were any of the examiners that the defense attorney went and, and uh, spoke to or that he... Um, went for second opinions, were they present during your autopsy in that case? No. Were there any other medical examiners at the district attorney's office at that time 
um, relied on to dismiss his case? Were they present with you in the autopsy of that baby? No, not in the autopsy, but that case was reviewed before I signed it out by several medical examiners at my office. I do not know the medical examiners and or coroners who reviewed it after the fact but not a single case in that office was signed out without having several medical examiners sign off on it. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, is it uncommon that other medical examiners may disagree with, with uh, certain findings? No, that's, that's being an expert witness. It's, <laughs> it, it ha this is the worst part of my job is testifying on the stand. Um, and I think if you ask any medical examiner or any other expert, that's what an expert is up here to be challenged. And in fact, I'm, you came here today and you testified to this jury that you disagreed with the findings at Doctor's Hospital. That's correct. And that you disagreed with the findings of Dr. Rodriguez. Yes. And based on your observations and looking at the, at the necrosis and what was going on deep into the, the, the dermis of this baby, this was caused by some sort of puncture and not a spider wound, correct? That's correct. And going back to Alabama, were you ever, you were never disciplined for any wrongdoing or any malpractice? There was no wrongdoing and there was no malpractice. Somebody just disagreed with my opinion on this case. And, and, and ultimately it was the DA, somebody like me, who went before the judge and said, I'm going to agree with the defense examiners instead of the state medical examiner. Is that right? Well, I don't know that he said that, but the case was dismissed. I was here. I was not. A, I wasn't there to defend myself, so or to defend the case. And, but you still stand by your findings back then. Hundred percent. Okay. I'm going to finish off with. Uh, uh, you said you made a, a determination of a finding of death in this case, correct? Yes. You, okay. My approach on. are the pending ones. We don't have the amended ones. Sorry. But I'll explain can, it. Can yeah. you speak to into the record? Oh, I'm sorry. So what I'm showing you here, uh, are you familiar with these documents? Yes. So these are um, death certificates on both Dominic and Griselda. Um, these are the original pending death certificates. We have a certain number of days to sign our death certificates. So when we're pending things like toxicology or any kind of testing or uh, a lot of times we're pending investigation of the death by law enforcement. We sign them pending. These are the original pending death certificates. In any event, you, you did uh, declare them dead uh, there uh, at the scene, correct? Yes, they were pronounced dead at the scene, and then I later did sign their death certificates. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. No further questions. Uh, just uh, one or two more questions, Your Honor. Dr. Stern, uh, isn't it true that the Alabama Forensic Science Commission ruled in that case that, that in that case that we've been talking about that the child was in fact stillborn and not suffocated or strangled? I don't know if if they ruled it, but I do know that the. Um, whoever looked at that case on the defense side, their opinion was that the baby was stillborn, that it was a fetus. And the district attorney agreed, correct? Well, I don't know what he agreed with, but I do know he dismissed the case. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Judge. You, you may go about your business. I'm releasing Dr. Schur unless we want to keep her for some reason. No. All right, you are released, ma'am. You may go about Thank your you, business. Doctor. As much as I'd like to push on, I, I think we need to stop day one. And we'll push on in some other days, but not day one. Uh, I don't want to discourage you all from the rest of the trial. So uh, please, uh, as I dismiss you for the day, uh, remember that uh, the instructions that I've given you and that you have in your hands, and you can keep them to refresh your memory or go over them before you leave, either way, 
Uh, you will have exactly the same instruction for tomorrow morning, parking spots, uh, the, the healthy tacos that you may have here in the morning and the uh, uh, drinks that you have. And I'll, uh, again, if, if you wanna bring your own food, we have somewhere where you could you know, put it, the refrigerator in and heat it up and things of that nature uh, for snacks or whatnot you can keep there. Uh, I know that some of you brought waters out. If you're the type of person that needs that, good. Except that, remember that we don't have breaks at all the time. We do have them occasionally, so we'll get to your breaks if possible. But please realize that we might not be able to get them as, at the snap of a finger. So, all right. Having said that, have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. I'd like to be able to get started tomorrow morning before 9, so if we can get started by, I want to in 15 minute increments earlier. 8.45 tomorrow, so get here. If you get here at 8.15, it'll be fine. You can get them to eat or whatever it is. But I'd like to be able to get started tomorrow at 8.45. Thank you. All right, my jury. Before you knock, before you leave, Madam, give me a second. Just want to find out if I'm going to for you. Okay, meet her for tomorrow. All right, please have a seat. Do, are you going, do you suspect that you're going to need uh, an interpreter tomorrow? Do you want to? Interpreter, yes, yes. you will. Day two, Adriana yes. Flores, okay. Adriana will speak. She speaks English. All right. So yes, tomorrow, madam. Thank you. I don't know what time tomorrow, but it'll be sometime during the, maybe during okay. the morning. So, anyways, just log on. We'll take it from there. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Okay, I'm gonna log off here. Uh, you know, I'm using we're using Zoom only because of our interpreter. So. Uh, those are the, but no one else gets on, which is us. So it's just court staff, court interpreter. No one else is being admitted in, in case anybody tries to get in. Okay. Uh, anything else? We're good. Do you all have the list of who they're going to call tomorrow already? Yes. Yes, we'll give them the, the lineup for tomorrow. Lineup. All right. Very good. Thank you all. We'll be in recess until tomorrow then. Thank you.